Okay, so this morning, Lord willing, we're going to finish off Romans chapter 9. And we have, um, oh, well, we have uh, verses 24 through 33 to look at. I, I should have mentioned this to BJ since I know he likes to project these, but I'd like to back up just two verses and begin reading in verse 22 because it helps us to, um, to understand what, what the context of this is. And let me just mention, Paul has been talking about how God has the right over over, well, as the potter has right over the clay to make some vessels for honorable use and some for common use. So God has right over fallen humanity to make some vessels of mercy and other vessels prepared for destruction. And now he's wanting to emphasize that these vessels that he has prepared for mercy are not just from among the Jews, but also from among the Gentiles. And that was God's plan all along. So I'm trying to sketch this out so it'll be easy to follow what um, Paul is, is saying here. All right, so beginning in verse 22, he says, What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in that place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left it to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written. Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning. Now, remember, in this section, Paul has been answering objections that could be raised to his gospel. The first objection was, how can we know that God will keep his promises to us? Okay, to us, and again, remember that Rome, uh, the, the Roman Christian church was, we believe, primarily Gentile, even though it may have been established by Jews. It was primarily Gentile. How do we know God is going to keep his promise to us? Those wonderful promises Paul spoke about in Romans chapter 8, that nothing will ever separate us from the love of God if he didn't keep his promises to the Jews, if he didn't keep his promises to Israel. Well, Paul's response to this was he has kept those promises. Remember chapter 9, verse 6. They are not all Israel, that is the people of God, who are descended from Israel, that is, who are the children of Jacob. God never promised to save all of Jacob's physical children. He promised to save those whom he had chosen among them. Remember that this included Isaac, okay, but not Ishmael or the other children of Abraham. Jacob, but not Esau. Some of Jacob's children, but not all of them. And by the way, he's going to say more about that this morning in our passage. By the way, that college I went to that was dispensational college, uh, 
They also believe that at some point, and when we get to Romans chapter 11, I'll point out if I can remember by then, I'm sure the passage will remind me. They believe that there's going to come a time in history when all the Jewish people, all of them, will be saved. But I want us to see that that was never God's intent. There has always been a remnant, okay? A remnant is a small group among a larger group, okay? But he's going to say more about this in our passage. Well, this raised a second objection. God's discriminating, isn't he? He discriminates, okay? He singles out one over another. But how can God do that and still be just? Okay, that's what we looked at last week. Well, Paul's response to this was that this is God's sovereign right. Verse 18, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Paul just simply quotes a couple of Old Testament passages and said, this is the way God is. And if God does it, it must be right. It must be just because God cannot do otherwise. Now, that certainly is true. But we also went a little bit deeper into this and we take everything that Paul has told us in the book of Romans to see a few facts. The first one is God does not owe mercy to anyone. Okay, this is the mistake that, that a lot of people make. Mercy is something that cannot be deserved, it cannot be purchased, it's something that's given freely, that the person who's giving it must show sovereignly. Now, Paul has already reminded us earlier that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And because of that, he could have passed over all of us in his mercy and, and still have been absolutely just. So we need to remember, God does not owe mercy to anyone. Can God discriminate? Yes, he could discriminate against all of us. He could have said, I'm not going to save anyone. I'm not going to show any mercy. Secondly, we need to remember that fairness and justice are not the same thing. To be fair means to treat everyone the same. To be just means to give everyone exactly what they deserve. God isn't fair, okay? He discriminates, but he is just because he gives to everyone what they deserve. And understanding, of course, what Christ has done, he gives to some what Christ deserves. And then thirdly, as far as hardening someone, as he did in the case of Pharaoh, we do need to remember that God did not have to create additional sin in Pharaoh's heart in order to harden it. There was already plenty there, plenty, right? All he needed to do was simply pull back his gracious restraint which he did not owe to Pharaoh and he did not owe to anyone and let Pharaoh's sin take its course. God can do that and be absolutely just because he doesn't, he doesn't um, owe Pharaoh this restraint. Now, finally, Paul dealt with one last objection. If God chooses to leave us in our sin, if he makes us vessels of, you know, prepared for destruction, then how can he blame us for our sin? I mean, we're just doing what he determined we would do. Not, he's not going to show mercy on us, so we're basically going to have to go this direction. But again, Paul answered the same way as the potter has the right over his clay to make one vessel for honorable use and another for common use so God can show mercy to some and withhold it from others, leaving them to the consequences of their own sins. Okay, remember that the, the clay that God's working with is already a lump of clay that is bound for destruction. God is simply leaving some of the, uh, that clay in the state he finds it. But the other, he is making, you know, again, these vessels of mercy. And that's really the question that Paul's opponents should have been asking in the first place. Where's all this mercy coming from? If we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and if our sins deserve everlasting damnation... How can God be just in showing anybody mercy? Well, of course, we know Paul's already answered that question, though he didn't answer it specifically here. He can only do this because of what he has done in Christ through the gospel. If he had not given us his son to satisfy the demands of the law and to provide a sacrifice for our sins, all we could look forward to would be destruction. But because of what Christ has done, he can justly forgive us in Christ.
Now, last week, remember, Paul ended by telling us that these vessels of honor, and by the vessels of honor, he's referring to that Israel, okay? The Israel that is not, you know, from the Jacob's children exclusively. They are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, that spiritual Israel. These children of promise, this, how you say, the true Israel of God, include not only some from among the Jews, but also some from among the Gentiles. Now, that is the real mystery, okay? And that's what we're going to look at this morning. But this morning, he tells us that this has been God's plan all along, right? He said through the prophets that he was going to save Gentiles. He also said in the prophets that he would not save all the Jews, only a remnant, remember? But then he concludes by telling us why, humanly speaking, this has happened. The majority of the Jews failed because they were looking for it through their own works, through their own righteousness, through the law. But the Gentiles received it because they trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, first, Paul wants to point to the Old Testament to show us that it was always God's plan to save Gentiles. Now, we've noted already, and I've already said it once, that uh, the majority of the Christians in Rome were Gentiles. So Paul is addressing them. He's telling them what God's plan has been for them all along, right? And that should be an encouragement to them and a confirmation to them that everything's happening according to God's plan. But we do need to remember that we too are Gentiles. And so when Paul addresses this, he is talking about us. Is we've, if we've trusted in Jesus, if we've received that righteousness that comes by faith, if we are in Christ, okay, that is, you know, that's the fulfillment of God's plan from so many years ago. Now, in verses 25 and 26, Paul proves this by quoting from the prophet Hosea. Okay, Hosea, perhaps you'll recall... Perhaps you will if you've been going, you know, reading the Bible together with us and, and going through those studies with us. But Hosea w had been sent by God to announce judgment to the northern tribe. Remember when the kingdom of Israel was split between the two kingdoms, northern and southern, because of uh, Solomon's son Rehoboam and the fact that he threatened to make the yoke harder on them than his father had made and so forth. That northern kingdom, they were a wicked group of people. They did not have one righteous king. Rather, they were idolaters. You know, the, the first thing um, that Jeroboam did when he established that kingdom was to set up two golden calves for them to worship, placing one in Israel and one, I think, in Dan so that the northern kingdom wouldn't go to the southern kingdom in order to worship the true God. Well, God had sent Hosea to them to announce his judgment for this unrelenting idolatry. And let's not forget what idolatry is in God's eyes. Idolatry is adultery. They were going after other gods. God had, had taken them to be his bride, but his bride was going after other husbands, okay, other gods. Now, wanting to give them an object lesson of how they were treating him, God commanded Hosea to do something which we find to be somewhat difficult. It must have been especially difficult for Hosea. He had to marry a harlot for a wife to, to provide them this visual demonstration of what they are doing to God. And with this harlot, Hosea had three children. Now, when the first was born, the Lord said to him in Hosea 1, verses 4 through 5, Name him Jezreel. For yet in a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel. And I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. So this is the reason why you should name him Jezreel. Okay, now when the second one was born, the Lord said to him, in verse 6, Name her Lo-Ruhamah. Now, lo Rahama is simply the, the Hebrew, Hebrew words. Uh, this is the way we would pronounce it um, in Hebrew. It means no mercy. So call her no mercy, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel. No longer have mercy. That I would ever forgive them. Okay? And then finally in verse 9, she gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, name him Lo-Ami. And that means not my people. 
for you are not my people, and I am not your God. So what is it that God is communicating to the northern kingdom of Israel through Hosea? Well, basically, he's saying, for your spiritual adultery, your infidelity, your covenant breaking, I am putting you away. I am divorcing you. I am cutting you off. Okay, that was how severe God's judgment was against them. But the Lord, in the very next verse, goes on to say that he would yet show mercy to them. He says, yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. Now, it's interesting. God is divorcing them, but he's saying, I will take you to myself again. What's he talking about here? I think he's talking about the blessings of the greater grace of the new covenant when he takes from apostate Israel his chosen people. But again, Paul's emphasis in, in Romans chapter 9 is that this people that God is taking for himself out of Israel is not, is not composed only or exclusively of Jews, but it also includes Gentiles. And so Paul is applying this to the Gentiles because at this time or at the time before the blessings of the new covenant, they also are not his people. And as he would have mercy on some among Israel, so he would have mercy on some among the nations. Now, Paul is going to explain why. Okay, here, there's, there's the question. Why is God doing this? It, well, he's gracious and merciful, and he's extending the, you know, the boundaries of his kingdom you know, beyond just, uh, just the children of Abraham, just the Jews. And it, you know, the thought's going through my mind right now. I'm thinking about the prophecy that was made over the sons of Noah and how uh, the, tent, the tent of Shem would be enlarged and would include the children of Japheth. And that makes sense in, in the context of this whole thing because the children of Shem would be where the Jews come from and Japheth would be where the Gentiles come from. And so what, what he was saying is, I'm going to enlarge my, my covenant dealings to go beyond the Jews and include also the Gentiles. But, okay, why he does that, he's going to explain in Romans chapter 11. And we'll, we'll get to it when we get there. But some, as I've said before, believe that Gentile salvation, what Paul is talking about here, was a complete mystery in the Old Testament. Some want to believe that the church age, that what we're in currently, uh, was completely unknown to the Jews. And again, if you've ever been exposed to that argument, if you haven't, I don't have time really to explain all that goes into it. I just simply want to say this. That is not the case. Gentile salvation was known to the Jews, and they expected it, okay? Not just from our text, not just from this passage where Hosea appears to be addressing only the northern kingdom of Israel, but it's clear that he was intending to include all the nations of the earth. We read in our call to worship in Psalm 22, verse 7, all the ends of the earth, that's all the nations, will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. Gentile salvation. What does Gentile mean? Non-Jew. It means nations. Gentiles are the nations. In Psalm 2, the Lord says to his son, ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. And then he says through Isaiah, in Isaiah 49, verse 6, and again, remember, all this has to do with us. Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel, you know, to the Jews only? I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And praise God that this was God's plan. Now, there was nothing mysterious about Gentile salvation. The mystery had to do with what the Gentiles, um, with their being brought into God's covenant, as I had read earlier, and made equal with the Jews. Now, how do we know that that is the mystery? Well, because in Ephesians, I read chapter 2. Let me read chapter 3, just a few verses, verses 3 through 4. 
He says, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made a minister, according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the work, working of his power. Now notice the word that was repeated there several times. They are fellow heirs, fellow members, fellow partakers. Fellow with, with whom? Well, with Israel. Okay? That was the mystery, not Gentile salvation. I mean, the Jews were fine with the ideas of, of the Messiah also being ruled, uh, ruling over the Gentiles. Because remember, their conception of Messiah was not as a spiritual savior, but as a military one. Yeah, you can subject them. And even they will worship you, even they will serve you. That's fine as long as we have, you know, we're first place. We have the ascendants. But that's not how it was going to be. They were going to be equal with the Jews, fellow members of the same covenant, same body, same household. So he says, you are no longer strangers and aliens. Strangers to the covenants of God, aliens to the household of God, or alien, alienated from God. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. You know, there's, there's a parable that our Lord Jesus Christ used called the parable of the laborers. The laborers in the vineyard, how he goes at different times. Uh, the, the owner of the vineyard goes at different times into the marketplace and he finds people that are idle there. And he agrees with them for a denarius, a day's wage, and sends them into the vineyard. And then throughout the day, he goes and he finds more workers and more workers. Until at the end of the day, he gathers them all together. And he starts with the last that he, that he had hired. And he gives them their wage, a denarius, for working just maybe one or two hours. But then he comes to the first, and they think they're going to get more. But he ends up giving them what he agreed originally, which was the one denarius. And they complain. And it makes us wonder, does that mean it doesn't matter when you're saved, young or old, doesn't matter how much you do for God's glory in the kingdom of heaven, you're, we're, ever, we're all going to get the same reward? Is that what Jesus is teaching there? Well, clearly not, because in other places we're told that God's going to give us according to what we've done. You know, it, it, there's going to be a reward, there's going to be places of honor in the kingdom of heaven, and and places with, with less honor, but still have honor. It'll still be glorious and still wonderful. So what is he talking about in this parable? Well, I think what he is saying is that he calls the Jews first into his kingdom, and they begin to work for him. And towards the end of the day, as his plan is progressing, he, he later calls the Gentiles, and he makes them equal with those he originally calls See, that, that's the point. We're as much a part of God's people, of spiritual Israel, as the Jews. I think sometimes we think as the church that maybe we're even better than the Jews, but we need to remember the Jews were central to God's plan. He made all of his promises with the Jews. The only reason why we're blessed right now is because we have been made partakers with them of the promises God has made to the Jews. Okay? That's what the church is. We are receiving the promises made to Israel. We are, again, partakers with them in all these things. As Paul writes to the Galatians who were Gentiles, and you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. So we are the spiritual children of Abraham. We are spiritual Jews. We are spiritual Israel. Okay? We are a part of God's people. All right, so that wasn't a mystery. That was God's plan. Now, secondly, Paul points out that the Jews' rejection was also not a mystery. God never promised. He never intended to save them all. Remember, he told us earlier in the chapter that was not his plan. He promised to save a remnant. Quoting Isaiah, he says in verse 27, Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. It's always been a remnant. Now, from this passage, we see God was going to fulfill his promise to Abraham. You know, I will make your children as numerous as the stars of heaven or as the sand by the sea. But he intended to save only some. As we saw earlier, 
they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. You know, Paul is, is saying this to explain why the Jews rejected the Messiah. It's because they're not all Israel. They're not all God's chosen people who are descended from Jacob. So again, even though they're numerous, still it was planned just to save a remnant. And as for those that he wouldn't save, okay, they would be judged. That was also a part of his plan. Verse 28, for the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. Okay. Now, what do you think he's talking about there? He's actually referring, I believe, to 70 AD when the Lord brings judgment on the Jewish people for their rejection of the Messiah, which has not yet happened in Romans in, in when, he wrote, when Paul wrote this book. Now, if he had withheld his mercy, then all the Jews would have been swallowed up in his judgment. He says in verse 29, just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabaoth, which means the Lord of hosts, had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. Well, what does Sodom and Gomorrah look like? Well, they were leveled in God's judgment and destruction with fire. They're actually a picture of hell, okay? But God did show mercy, okay? If he hadn't shown mercy, all of, all of the Jews would have just been wiped out like Sodom and Gomorrah. But God determined to show mercy because of his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. Remember what we saw earlier? God said he would be, um, well, he would show mercy to a thousand generations, to those who love him and keep his commandments, which they can only do by his grace. Well, Abraham was such a person, and God was still showing mercy. Paul is going to tell us in, in Romans chapter 11 that they're still beloved for the sake of the fathers, even though they're your enemies because of the gospel. So God still is working with the Jews, and that's what Romans chapter 11 is really all about. Now, finally, Paul tells us why the Jews failed to receive God's mercy, but why the Gentiles found it, at least humanly speaking, and it's because how they went about it, how they went about seeking for these things. And, and here's where we need to, again, get into the mindset of the Jews. The Jews were seeking it through their works. I think we understand that. The Gentiles through Christ. Paul writes in verses 30 through 32, what should we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, and what he means by this is that they were not trying to earn their own righteousness through the law. Okay? They didn't pursue righteousness through the law. They attained righteousness. So what does that mean? Well, it means that they gained the righteousness that comes from Christ that makes them acceptable to God. Even the righteousness which is by faith, by trusting in Jesus Christ and in His work alone. That's the reason why the Gentiles are saved, okay? But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, that is seeking to earn their own righteousness through their own works, did not arrive at that law. And I, what Paul means by this, I believe, is this. They didn't measure up to that righteousness that the law requires. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. Their works are never going to measure up. Only Christ's righteousness will. So rather than receiving God's free gift of righteousness in Christ, freely offered to the gospel, the Jews tried to earn their own. And Paul says, in doing this, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. Just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. You see, this is why they were offended by Jesus. is because they thought God gave them the law so that by keeping the law, they would make themselves acceptable to him. You know, that, that's essentially what Roman Catholicism believes, by the way, with, with God's help. You make yourself acceptable to God. God receives you and you're justified and so forth. Now, they may have been a little bit more on the outskirts of works-based salvation, but the idea is God gave us the law so that by keeping it, God will accept us, okay? 
Well, they thought that because they were a righteous nation, because God had given them the law and they had kept the law, that God was going to send His Messiah not to save them from their breaking of the law, but to lead them to victory over the Romans. Remember that? They saw him as a military leader. That's what they were looking for. A military leader, a savior from Rome, not a savior from sin. And that's why when Jesus offers himself to them as the manna which comes down from heaven, the bread which gives life, the only door through which they could come to the Father, the one alone who could give them eternal life, that that stumbled them. That, they rejected that because they thought God had already accepted them. So they stumbled over him. They were offended by him. And you know what? Christ is an offense to everyone who thinks that they already are good enough, right? They're already good enough for God to receive them. That's one of the reasons why people don't want to hear about Jesus is because they think they don't need Jesus because they think they're good enough without him. But many of the Gentiles, on the other hand, when they heard about Christ, they received him, and through him the blessings that were meant for Israel. Okay, and on this point, let's end. Verse 33, he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Now again, the Gentiles received him by faith, the righteousness that makes him acceptable to God. They were not disappointed. Okay. And we who have received the Lord Jesus Christ, if we who have trusted in him, he has certainly not disappointed us either, has he? Okay, he has washed away our sins by his sacrifice. We don't have to worry about hell. Okay, hell is not our future. Heaven is. He has clothed us with his righteousness through his obedience. God accepts us. We are acceptable in Christ. And as we'll hear, I think we've heard from Sibs, we've heard, I think, tonight by Thomas Goodwin and certainly by John Owen. When the Father looks at us, He doesn't see us. He sees His Son. And He receives us as His Son and not as us. And that's one of the things that always concerns us, isn't it? When God looks at us, I mean, what does He see? He sees all this sin. No, He sees Christ. And that's that's the, the marvelous blessing of the gospel. Now, let me give you a taste of Thomas Goodwin, the Puritan we're going to be looking at this evening. He once wrote this. In God's sight, there are two men. Okay? There, there's only two men as far as God is concerned in the world, Adam and Jesus Christ. And these two men have all other men hanging at their girdle strings. Now, we might not put it that way. But what he means by this <laughs> is God sees everyone in the entire human race as one or the other, either as Adam or as Jesus Christ. We are in one or the other. Now, if we are in Adam, then God sees not only Adam's sin, but all of our sin clinging to us, and he condemns us justly for our sins. Again, vessels of, of wrath prepared for destruction. But we're, if we're in Jesus Christ... He sees us clothed with the righteousness of Christ. He sees us with the beauty of Christ. And he receives us as Christ with his whole heart. That, that is what the Bible tells us. And certainly, that's not a disappointment. That is a marvelous thing. No one who believes in him will ever be disappointed. Now, Paul has developed this a little bit more. I'll just say briefly, not only will we not be disappointed in this life, since the Lord has promised to work everything in our lives together for good, we will not be disappointed for all eternity once we enter into heaven where God reveals his love and his mercy and his glory forever for us to marvel at and to be filled with and to, again, just be uh, filled with his love and um, amazed at, at his glory. Our blessedness is going to increase for all eternity that we will never be disappointed that uh, we've made this choice, Christ will never let us down. Now, that is what we should be thinking about. That is what we should be praising him for as we come to the table this morning because this is what reminds us of these blessings and where they come from. Again, that the Father loved us so much that he was willing to give his son for us to suffer and die in our place in order that we might be forgiven forgiven 
and be in Christ and received as Christ. So let's take just a few moments, bow in silent prayer. Let's ask the Lord to prepare us to come to the table. Remember, we come confessing our sins to him, but knowing that as we do this, all of our sins are washed away in Christ. We know that we are accepted in the beloved. Remembering also the warning that if we're not trusting in Christ, or if we are involved in some sin that we're not willing to relent of, not repent of, that we need to abstain. Okay? But if, we're, if we are trusting him and we're to the best of our knowledge serving him, we repented of our sins and he calls us to come and to be reminded of his love and mercy and to be filled with his spirit. Let's just spend a few moments in prayer.